sure you are. I've always depended on the kindness of strangers. Come back to New Orleans Walk the quarter with me And we'll ride the Mississippi Down to the sea America has only three cities New York, San Francisco, and New Orleans Everywhere else is Cleveland, Tennessee Williams. Hi, I'm Brian Batt, and welcome to The Kindness of Strangers. The Tennessee Williams New Orleans Literary Festival was about to celebrate its 34th anniversary this past March, and well, you know what happened. So, Lawrence Gobble, the incoming president, and a dear friend of mine, and I, put our heads together and tried to figure out something to celebrate the festival and Tennessee Williams online. And this is what we've got. We asked our friends, um, all actors, uh, nationally known, internationally known, and locally known, to all come together and recite poems or quotes or tell great stories about doing a Tennessee Williams play or even meeting Tennessee Williams. And the result, I think you're going to enjoy. Um, I personally love the festival. I've participated in many different ways. Years ago, I was on a panel after I wrote my first book. And on that panel was um, Armistead Mopin and Zoe Caldwell and John Waters. Uh, it was a little intimidating. And uh, next, I worked with the wonderful Alison Frazier, who you will see tonight. And we did a staged reading of um, Talk to Me Like the Rain and Let Me Listen. One of my favorite things is the tribute readings, where a theme is selected and actors and writers come together at a, for a night and read different poems, uh, scenes from plays, letters. And a couple of years ago, the theme was The Italian Summer of Tennessee Williams. And I was assigned to read some of his letters. And they were so beautifully written, so passionate, so thought-provoking, so sensual, <laughs> that I, I really identified with them. And it was so actable, and it ignited once again, my love for Tennessee Williams' work and words. And so much so that I approached Paul, the head of the festival, and said, Paul, next year is the tricentennial of New Orleans. We have to do something about celebrating New Orleans and Tennessee together because New Orleans was his spiritual home. And he said, why don't you write it? Be careful what you ask for. So I sat down to write it. And as I did, very organically, it came together. I realized that some of his plays, when I saw them, some of the words shaped my lives, my life, and, and guided me in a certain way. Certain quotes um, guided me. And questions I asked as I was going along, his words had the answer. So we put them all together, and, and the festival, we did it um, on the stage of the wonderful Le Petit Theater at uh, 2 p.m. And I invited my good friend Betty Buckley, who you will see here tonight. She was filming a series in town. And little did I know that a producer happened to be in the audience. Well, at the end of the show, I think it went well, Betty came running up saying, you've got to work on this. You've got to. This is really something for you, Brian. And then I got a call from the producer, and he said he wants to move this to the next level. He said, who would you like to direct? And before I could say anything, he suggested Michael Wilson. And Michael Wilson was the, the artistic director at Hartford Stage when they did the whole collection of Tennessee Williams' plays, so he knows his stuff. But I'd also just done the L.A. premiere of Grey Gardens with Michael Wilson and Betty Buckley. Coincidence? I don't know. Fate? Yes. Then Betty called Michael and said, you've got to do this. And when Betty calls, you kind of just do it. Anyway. We've had two workshops, one in New York, one here at Le Petit again, and we're about to work on it some more. And who knows, soon, hopefully, you may see it on the boards. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the kindness of strangers. And remember, donate, and donate often, and help support the Tennessee Williams New Orleans Literary Festival. And with no further ado, the kindness of strangers. Hi, it's Patricia Clarkson. Uh, in 2004, 
uh, I went to the Kennedy Center to play Blanche. And um, every night when I would perform, I would bring my beloved dog, Bo, and he would sit in my dressing room as I took the three-hour marathon journey of streetcar. And, but right next to my dressing room were these big metal doors that were always very closed because they led to this rather, you know, the belly of the theater, this Byzantine underneath of the Kennedy Center in this large stage. And, um, and so one night while I was performing uh, towards the end of the play, you know, the brutal, brutal scene between Blanche and Stanley and we got to that scene, and about midway through the scene, every time I spoke, I heard this muffled bark coming from underneath the stage. Woo! 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 And when Stanley would speak, silence. But every time I spoke, woo! 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 My dog had a very distinct bark, and so the scene, as you know, is progressing, it's getting more and more violent and more and more emotional and more and more traumatic. And I'm, Stanley, please, Stanley, woo, woo, woo. And I'm crying and I'm hysterical. And every time I speak, woo, woo, woo. And I'm getting through the scene and it's like the trauma on top of trauma because I'm like, oh my God, someone please save me from Stanley and someone please save my dog and I'm you know crying and it's I'm, I'm just frantic I'm literally out of my mind in the middle of this scene and I but I've got to get through the scene and and I, I you know it's the Kennedy Center and I'm Blanche I got to get through the scene and I finally I get to the end of the scene I'm just destroyed I run off stage and my dresser grabs me so tightly, I think I still have a broken rib, and she says, Patty, we have him, we have him. And I was, I was so traumatized, I was, oh my God. She was like, but now you need to just, you need to get dressed and do the next scene, because the next scene is I'm in tiara and the feather boa. And, but I finished that scene got dressed, but I have to tell you something. That incredible scene between Blanche and it's never gone, it's never gone better. It was the best it had ever been. The best it had ever gone, ever, in the run of the show. Woo! 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 <laughs> I've had more than one interaction uh, with the Tennessee Williams Festival, all of them interesting and amusing. Uh, my favorite, though, is probably 10 years ago, I was completing uh, my documentary film about the 2005 flood and trying to get the federal judge, the only federal judge, to uh, have any involvement with that uh, situation. A case involving the Mr. Go failure uh, came to his attention, and he was ruling on it. And uh, we were having a discussion. And at the time, uh, I was invited, along with uh, co-creator of Treme, the TV series, to judge the Stella yelling contest at the conclusion of the Tennessee Williams Festival. So we're both up on a balcony overlooking Jackson Square, and uh, down below, uh, 25 guys uh, were covering themselves either with their own sweat or beer, uh, and then yelling Stella up at a woman parading on the balcony in a black slip, uh, to the amusement of all. And about halfway through, a break was called, and uh, the woman in the black slip walked over and introduced herself to me. I'm the judge's clerk, she said, and his wife. He appeared in the movie, and we've become great friends since. And it taught me a really important lesson. Maybe not everybody in New Orleans, but a whole lot of people value the opportunity to have more than one life. Uh, the first time, or oh, actually the only time I met Tennessee Williams was when I had just come to New York in 77. Now, I was, I was a baby, fresh out of college, and I think he was nearing the end of his career in 
Anyway, somehow at this celebration for Tennessee and his work, I was assigned to watchdog him, to babysit him, to make sure he got there, make sure he got on the stage, etc. Well, he arrived um, completely drunk, which was not so unusual. But for some reason, he insisted on coming up through the orchestra pit to the stage. Now, this was probably very bad planning on his part because he wasn't that steady on his feet, but I, come on, I was a kid. I didn't, I wasn't going to say no, Mr. Williams. I wasn't going to, you know, I wasn't going to say anything. I just tried to keep him from falling off the steps up to the stage, which actually I failed to do. Uh, yeah, it is a memory I will never forget. Nobody sees anybody truly, but all through the flaws of their own ego. That is the way we all see each other in life. Vanity, fear, desire, competition. All such distortions within our own egos condition our vision of those in relation to us. Add to those distortions in our own egos the corresponding distortions in the egos of the others. And you see how cloudy the glass must become through which we look at each other. That's how it is in all living relationships, except when there is that rare case of two people who love intensely enough to burn through all those layers of opacity and see each other's naked hearts. From a letter to Ilya Kazan, 1947. If I got rid of my demons, I'd lose my angels. I first met Tennessee face to face in 1978, January of 1978. Um, I had seen him through the years around the quarter, we would pass each other on the sidewalk, and, and is the case in New Orleans, we would nod to each other. But in 1978, I was part of a program called the Lanyap Program that the public library here was running, inviting authors back to the city. And when the program was just winding down, he got in touch and said he had decided that he would like to come, and he had never given a a speech in New Orleans, a public speech. And I met him with Don Lee Keith, who was a journalist here, was a mutual friend of mine in Tennessee's. And we were all Mississippians, of course. And Tennessee and I were born about 70 miles apart. He was, I was born in Ecru, Mississippi. He was born in, in Columbus, Mississippi. And Don Lee and I met him at Marty's restaurant, which was one of Tennessee's favorites because it was across the street from his house. But we walked, the three of us, Don Lee and, and Tennessee and I, over to the uh, Theater for the Performing Arts. And as we walked, Tennessee and I uh, talked. And I remember he asked me, uh, how is our property values in New Orleans? And I said, well, they're at this point, they're very good. They're going up. And, and uh, and he said, oh, I'm, I'm so happy. He said, you know, I've just bought property wherever I went. He said, I'm just like a sly old fox. David Kaplan talks about uh, uh, what he calls Mississippi magic tongue. And that's what Tennessee had when he talked. And it was just wonderful to listen to him, that marvelous uh, husky Delta accent of his, uh, which is, was absolutely adorable. I created a literary walking tour of the quarter and a Tennessee Williams tour. Of course, I've continued to to study Tennessee and to, as long as I was teaching. I taught uh, Tennessee Williams seminars at the University of New Orleans, and I have published six books on Tennessee. Um, and that's continued to be an interest of mine. When I first read Tennessee, I felt he had 
he had taken my material and I, I at that time was very anxious to be a, a novelist or a playwright or something. And, and I wanted to write that same sort of lush, wonderful stuff that he and Faulkner were writing. He is our, our poet playwright. He was, his language is completely poetic. Another teacher at UNO who taught drama and she didn't like the fact that the, I, they had given me the Tennessee Williams seminar, though she professed not to like Tennessee Williams. And, and she told me once, she said, uh, it, the worst play that Eugene O'Neill ever wrote is better than anything Tennessee Williams ever wrote. At which point I said to her, uh, quote a line from Eugene O'Neill. And she was hard put to come up with one. He's become a part of our, of our heritage, uh, our shared heritage as, as Americans and as members of the world for that matter. With Tennessee Williams, there are people all over the country, all over the world, quoting Tennessee, saying, if nothing else, I've always depended on the kindness of strangers. Some things are not forgivable. Deliberate cruelty is not forgivable. I don't want realism. I want magic. Yes, yes, magic. I try to give that to people. For time is the longest distance between two places. Hi, I'm Betty Buckley, and I'm speaking to you tonight on behalf of the Tennessee Williams Festival. Um, so uh, I love New Orleans, and I love Le Petit Theater, and one of my greatest experiences ever was going to visit New Orleans, and my friend Brian Batt introduced me to a brilliant Tennessee Williams scholar named Kenneth Holdage. And Kenneth took us to every historic site in New Orleans where Tennessee had done some of his greatest work. And then we ended up at uh, Kenneth's apartment and had a great bottle of wine. And it was one of the most magical nights in my life. I'll never forget it. I also remember a year and a half, two years ago, I saw Brian Batt uh, present uh, his new play, which is very um, done through the inspiration of Tennessee and his love and for how Tennessee influenced him as a young man. Um, I actually got to audition for Tennessee Williams when I was a young actress for his play Red Devil Battery Sign in the original Broadway production. And I was beyond um, thrilled and uh, nervous, obviously, to audition knowing that Tennessee Williams himself was in the theater. I got offered the role of the standby for Claire Bloom, and my agent said that I, he didn't want me to do the job. There was an, another thing in conflict, and I got that close to actually working with Tennessee Williams. It was an amazing thing. Anyway, I love New Orleans. I love Le Petit Theater. All the best, Tennessee Williams Festival. Different playwrights write about different things. Uh, they all have their strengths. They all have their, the ideas that they want to deal with, that they want to tackle. But they all write about something called the human condition. And I wasn't entirely certain of what that meant until I read Tennessee Williams plays. He's writing to the human being, the humanness in all of us, our frailty, our foibles, to our contradiction, the way our strengths can become weaknesses and our weaknesses can become strengths. I've done Glass Menagerie, I've done Orpheus Descending, and I've done Streetcar Named Desire. In all of them, there is a sense of the randomness of human life that he manages to capture in broad strokes and leaves us to fill in the specificity as it relates to our life, which is what a play, what a playwright should do. It's not about telling us what to think and how to feel. 
It's about him saying, I think there are a lot of us out there who feel these things. And then he'll say, do you? And more often than not, the answer is, yes, I do. And I thought I was the only one. The genius of Tennessee is that he speaks to all of us by talking to us as individuals. I've never read anyone who manages to capture chaos, the randomness, the, the, the messiness of life, of humanity. In trying to speak to one of us at a time, he managed to speak to all of us together and shed a light on our humanity in a way that I don't think anyone before or since has managed to do. His is a truly singular voice. I'm Brenda Curran, and I love the Tennessee Williams New Orleans Literary Festival. I'm involved every year. Thank you, Paul Willis. I'm also so grateful to Dr. Kenneth Holditch, who I think the year was 1988, invited me and David Kaplan down from New York City to perform our adaptation of Eudora Welty's stories, Sister and Dyslexia. Dr. Holditch was the executive director then, and he arranged for us to perform at Le Petit Théâtre. It was a 9.30 Saturday morning performance. There I am waiting in the wings uh, for Anne Rice to come off the stage. I'm nervous because the well, it was an audience full of um, high, school, <laughs> high school kids, and they were uh, very noisy and very restless, and I just imagined they wanted to be elsewhere. But I was wrong. They were so fantastic. I had a ball. And later on, David and I were sitting on the levee, uh, having our Café du Monde beignets and chicory coffee, watching the river boats. What an introduction that was to New Orleans. Later that afternoon, we were taken to a party at this, the car drives up in front of this beautiful house, which turns out to be the Boltman residence, which was connected to their famous funeral home. Uh, on the lawn, I, I'm, then I see these memes or mimes doing their Marcel Marceau meme thing. Inside, the house is full of festival revelers, eating and drinking, every single room is packed and I'm there I am in an upstairs bedroom cocktail in hand talking to some fascinating festival participant and I think I, I I hear an argument in the bed and I when I dare to look over who is there but Brick and Maggie cat on a hot tin roof then I, I you know I'm making my way down the stairs and I have to step over Archie, Archie Lee and Baby Doll going through something. <laughs> David points out this nun in beautiful white starched regalia, snatching a cigarette from a young woman suddenly last summer. You know, it's said that, that uh, Tennessee Williams was, was inspired by the solarium at the Boltman residence for Sebastian's garden in suddenly last summer. I don't know. What I do know is that I moved to New Orleans years later and was in a production of Suddenly Last Summer directed by M.A. Hayes, Violet Venable. Without me, he died last summer. That was his last summer's poem. One long ago summer, now why am I thinking of this? My son, Sebastian, said, Mother, listen to this. He read me Herman Melville's description of the Incantatas, the Galapagos Islands. Quote, take five and twenty heaps of cinders dumped here and there in an outside city lot. Imagine some of them magnified into mountains and that vacant lot, the sea, and you'll have a fit idea of the general aspect of the Incantadas, the enchanted isles, extinct volcanoes, looking much as the world at large might look after a last conflagration. 
end quote. But there are things that happen between a man and a woman in the dark that sort of make everything else seem <laughs> unimportant. All cruel people describe themselves as paragons of frankness. Show me a person who hasn't known any sorrow and I'll show you a superficial. We are sentenced to solitary confinement inside our own skins for life. So, it's gotta be late 1960s. And I'm walking in the French Quarter with my mom, Ella Brennan. She's going to work and I often went with her. Anyway, we're walking down the street and a man waves, hey Ella. And she goes, hey Tennessee. And we're just walking and I said, mom, who was that? Was that Tennessee Ernie Ford? Now, I don't know why Brian wanted me to tell that story because it's highly embarrassing. I probably was eight years old though, so I forgive myself. Anyway, lifelong fan of Tennessee Williams, not. Tennessee, Ernie Ford. Instinct, it must have been, directed me here to the Vucure of New Orleans, down country as a river flows, no plan. I couldn't have consciously, deliberately selected a better place than here to discover, to encounter my true nature, exposition. Shit. I'm Michael Cerberus, and that was a small snippet from Vucare by Tennessee Williams. Um, I have to say that growing up in West Virginia, as I did, uh, I was first introduced to New Orleans through Tennessee Williams. But it wasn't really until years and years later, when I finally arrived in New Orleans myself, that I feel like I was finally introduced to Tennessee Williams. Sadly, not in person, but um, but there's an understanding that you can have of the people and the places and the sounds and the souls of the characters in Tennessee Williams' writing that you can only really begin to understand when you walk the streets of New Orleans and you smell the smells and you hear the voices and you... Uh, drink the drink and taste the tastes of that uh, that irreplaceable city. Um, I, in a lot of ways, somehow, I think uh, productions that I would see of Streetcar and others seem to, to happen in a, in a place that, that didn't really match the, the words that I was seeing on the paper. And it wasn't until I was actually on Elysian Fields and uh, knew where Desire Street was and knew where Esplanade was and Toulouse and uh, that it finally started to make sense to me. He's more than anything a, a home for the misfits and the, the outsiders and the, the lost and the uh, troubled and damaged um, and Certainly this world is full of that. Um, and it's why the Tennessee Williams Festival is such a vital and important thing, um, that it takes place in New Orleans and brings great writers and, and lovers of great writing to this city that's the home of great storytellers and storytelling um, is makes it unlike any, any other festival. Um, and it's, it's a, terrible shame that it couldn't happen this year, but it just makes it all the more important that we support it so that we can all gather together next year. Um, we need to be listening to each other's stories. We need to be telling our truths and sharing our truths with each other and, uh, and listening to truths that are difficult to hear sometimes. Um, I'm looking forward to all of that next year in New Orleans at the Tennessee Williams Festival and I hope I'll see you there. At the age of 14, I discovered writing as an escape from a world of reality in which I felt acutely uncomfortable. We 
were all of us children in this vast kindergarten, trying to spell God's name with the wrong alphabet blocks. Nothing human disgusts me unless it's unkind. I want to infect you with the tremendous excitement of living because I believe that you have the strength to bear it. Thank you for being here with us to share in the kindness of strangers. The Tennessee Williams and New Orleans Literary Festival is a five-day celebration. It's both a literary festival and a theater festival annually around March the 26th. Why that date? Because that's the birthday of our patron saint and source of inspiration, playwright Tennessee Williams. And during the festival, we have over 125 events, including writing workshops, master classes, literary panel discussions, theater events, book fair, tribute reading, scholars conference, walking tours, music events, culinary and cocktail events, and interviews with legendary writers and actors. And we definitely want to thank our performers for this great program. We hope that you'll enjoy the rest of the program. And we please ask you to give whatever you can. Any amount counts. And thank you for keeping the festival and the New Orleans performing arts scene alive. Thanks. Thank you. I've got the guts to die. What I want to know is, do you have the guts to live? On December 28, 1938, Tom Williams wrote, I am delighted, in fact, enchanted with this glamorous, fabulous old town. I've been here about three hours, but have already wandered about the Vucare and noticed many exciting possibilities. Here, surely, is the place I was made for, if any place, in this funny old world. That was three hours after he first landed in New Orleans. I've uh, got two things in common with Tennessee Williams. We're both St. Louis transplants, although he hated it a little bit more than I did. And we both love New Orleans. Fell in love at first sight, actually. I've been lucky enough to be able to do four Williams plays, uh, one for CBS TV that Carl Malden dropped by on and, uh, and kind of offered a few tips. That was nice. And I did a stage reading of the last of my solid gold watches for the Tennessee Williams Festival in New Orleans. And I think I liked that one the best. Thank you. Hi, everyone. All you theater lovers and Tennessee Williams fans, I love New Orleans, and one of the reasons I do is because it's a place where I got to do probably a piece of theater that I'm most proud of in my life, and that is Tennessee Williams' Words and Music. Here's the CD that we uh, did down in New Orleans uh, with some of the greatest New Orleans musicians. And I am grateful to the city, not only for being one of the most magnificent grand dames of cities in the world, but also for being such a marvelous hostess to the Literary Festival of the great Tennessee Williams. Please give them lots of money so they can serve a life. Bye-bye. Or au revoir. Everybody is nothing until you love them. Life is an unanswered question, but let's still believe in the dignity and the importance of the question. Success and failure are equally disastrous. Why did I write? Because I found life unsatisfactory. Don't you love those long, rainy afternoons in New Orleans when an hour isn't just an hour, 
but a little piece of eternity dropped into your hands and who knows what to do with it. In American culture, we've forgotten the importance of art. It's the forum where we reflect on who we are, our triumphs, our failures, who we hope to be, and where we've come from. It is there in that forum where we decide what our values are and then act on them. And it's there in that forum where Tennessee Williams thrived. He was a man of great vision, great confidence, and great skill, who tapped into the American psyche, into the American heart, and showed us a new way of humanity and giving us the power to mark our passing on the road just like you write it on a tree. We were here. And it's for that reason we should always remember Tennessee Williams and support this festival. Thank you for watching tonight and I hope you enjoyed all the tales and stories and quotes and the beauty of Tennessee Williams' genius. I hope it sparked uh, a little, little a love for Tennessee or let that flame burn brighter. I hope you can support the Tennessee Williams New Orleans Literary Festival and come to the festival next year. We'll be here. And remember, we've always depended on the kindness of strangers. Thanks. Come back to New Orleans Walk the quarter with me And we'll ride the Mississippi On down to the sea My soul is a river And it's flowing strong Even though you just left You've been gone too long Only one night, how can so much be given? This town grabs hold of you, and it's part, part of my living. From bourbon to royal, the streets are calling my name. And there's something about you, and I won't, won't be the same. Get here. Take a boat, take a plane, take a train. Take a pilot, move the city park. Just get on back to New Orleans.